Okay, um, so welcome to World Soil Day for the GROW webinar. Um, my name is Professor Mel Woods, I'm Chair of Creative Intelligence and I'm working on the GROW framework and project for demonstrating and replicating a citizen observatory here at the University of Dundee. So today we're exploring how citizens can make the connection between soil health and come to combat soil pollution and how we're supporting land use practices in a changing climate. So thank you for joining us. We know some of you who are here today having taken part in GROW activities this year and in the online course that ran in November. That was Citizen Science from Data to Action. For others, it will be a first encounter with the GROW Observatory. So it's great to have you all here today. Um, for those of you who don't know, the GROW Observatory is an EU project that's empowering a community of citizens to gather data on soil and land use in a changing climate to create positive impact in the world. And to celebrate World Soil Day, we're, we've brought together some experts in citizen science, in agroecology, soil and community engagement to discuss how citizen scientists have been learning about the challenges facing soils in the 21st century, from pollution being a key issue and how they're being part of the solution by acquiring the skills to understand and monitor their soils. So later in the session, we'll be answering your own questions live. We'd really love to receive your questions via Twitter, hashtag there on the screen, grow webinar, or on the chat in YouTube. And so it's not too late to submit. But back to our introductions now. Um, and we're going to be joined today, first of all, by Alice Ambler. Um, Alice is a geographer interested in environmental hazards, citizen science research at the GROW, and she's helping to work on the MOOT con content. That's our massive open online courses, our education program. Um, she's doing a regenerative practices literature review, and she's taking part in the, and supporting the polyculture experiment. Next, we have Dr. Naomi van der Velden, who works with the Permaculture Association Britain, um, and she's working on for GROW on reviewing the generative practices, growing practices and the polyculture experiment as well. And that started in our April online course in 2018. We've just looked at the results in the last course in November that we spoke about previously. She's also supporting science underpinning other GROW activities. Um, we're also joined by Pavlos Georgiadis in Culture Police, an ethnobotanist and biodiversity researcher and an organic olive grower based in Greece. He's the GROW community champion, working with our network of community champions across nine European countries to deliver GROW's changing climate mission. And last but very much not least is Victoria Burton, also from Permaculture Association Britain. She's a soil biodiversity researcher and GROW's citizen science facilitator and designer. I'm going to go over to Victoria now, who's going to start the, the session today by giving an introduction to soil health. So over to you, Victoria. It's not, it's not an alert, an alert um, substrate. It's full of life. In fact, um, it can be a lot of life. I mean, I've counted nearly 200 earthworms in just one um, spade's worth of soil and 1,600 different mites in one metre of forest soil. And it's not just in terms of numbers either. Um, forest soils can have over a thousand different species in just a metre. And in fact, soil is thought to be home to a quarter of the life on Earth. And this life is important in keeping our soils healthy, enabling them to grow our food and filter our water. But unfortunately, a lot of human activities um, damage soil health and um, make it difficult for these um, soil organisms to survive. For example, many agricultural practices um, use ploughing and tillage, which uh, breaks up earthworm burrows and can also contribute to soil erosion so when actually soil is washed or blown away and lost um, thankfully there are a number of methods which can actually maintain and restore soil health such as adding organic materials such as manure or mulch or compost or using cover crops so growing things on surface to at all times of year to avoid the soil being washed away 
within the GROW Observatory, we're supporting growers to learn about practices that support and maintain healthy soils for our online courses and the GROW app. And this information is supported by scientific evidence that our grown scientists have been collecting from papers. We're also supporting communities to monitor soil conditions, exchange knowledge on growing methods, and work together to solve local issues in our grow places. And for more on how World Soil Day is being celebrated in our grow places, I'm going to pass to Pavlos. Hello everyone um, and happy World Soil Day. Today we have events celebrated all over the world by communities of practice and communities who are working with the soil and are trying to advocate for the protection of it. And um, as you all know, the Grow Observatory is uh, working uh, for soil health and is mobilizing uh, citizens across Europe to use data and to come together in order to provide solutions uh, that lead to the regeneration of soils and the protection of soils. So in the map you can see some of the locations where um, uh, World Soil Day events are being held across the world. The GROW communities at, the, at our GROW places have been organizing 14 events in eight countries this week. Many of those events are happening right now. And I think our community in Portugal is uh, watching us live in this webinar. So hello to our friends in Portugal. Uh, but apart from our events that are taking place uh, in physical space, we also have a very um, intensive online presence today for World Soil Day. Um, we are launching our data art by the Code of Soil, which, is, uh, been, which has been developed by our resident and artist, Cassia Molga and Scanner. And you can download uh, the um, app for the data art by following the URL that you can see now in your screens, www.growobservatory.org slash Code of Soil. So what is this art, this piece of art? Our artists uh, have been working with the soil data that citizens are collecting using soil moisture sensors in our grow places. So as soon as 1,000 people, 1,000 of you download this app in their desktops and their computers, then this art will pop up in your screen and it will be gathering data from the closest grow place to your location. And ever since that time, every time that one of the Sentinel satellites passes above the location that you are uh, based at that moment, this data art is going to pop up in your screen. Uh, and this is an arty way for us to demonstrate the whole soil to sky connection uh, that uh, GROW is demonstrating. The integration of data coming from the soil, from the land, with data coming from the closed space through the Sentinel satellite system. And of course, we are very active in Twitter today. If you are uh, following the Grow Observatory on Twitter, then please uh, follow the discussion using hashtag Grow Soil Health. Um, there is a very active dialogue happening uh, over there and there are images from our Grow Places events uh, that we are retweeting. There are a number of uh, poll questions that we have there. So at Grow Soil Health uh, is the place to follow on Twitter today to celebrate World Soil Day. And that is for me for just now. Here is Naomi for you. I think it does appear that we've lost Naomi just now. Um, so maybe what we'll do, um, uh, let's have a look. What we'll do, um, so Naomi's um, talking about um, plant communities and benefits and, and biomes to local communities of plants and associated animals, including in soils. Um, maybe Victoria, are you able to um, um, update us on, on that whilst we try to reconnect with, uh, with Naomi? Yeah, I can give it a go. Um, so, uh, in in the wild, uh, there's lots of different 
plants and animals all living together, including in the soils. And we know that there's strength in this diversity. There's increased resilience and adaptivity to things like climate change and local disturbances like soil erosion and pollution. But this actually also might work into food production. And one of the ways we can um, use this um, natural... Oh, is Naomi back? Can you hear me without Yes. Me? <laughs> sorry. Would you like to take over, Naomi? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, but I was... Uh, and Victor has done a great job of describing um, some of the important things that come with these distinct plant communities, which is their strength that comes from diversity. Um, and with this diverse amalgamation of plants, we also have diverse communities of animals, both within the soil and in the ecosystem around them. And this diversity can really help those ecosystems be much more resilient to change. So things like climate change, but also events like soil erosion or soil pollution. So we have plants and animals there ready to kind of recolonize areas. And this natural community strength can also feed into food production. Um, and we can see benefits from this. Um, and this is called uh, polyculture, so as an alternative to monoculture, where you have just one species growing in a large area, polycultures are lots of species growing together. And we know there are benefits to these, like reduced pest damage and improved productivity, as well as those benefits to soils and ecosystems. Unfortunately, these, these polycultures, certainly three or more crops growing together, have been massively understood, understudied by science, so we really don't know very much about them. And both at the large farm scale, but also importantly at the scale of growing in our gardens, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence and a lot of individuals that are trying these out. But we've learned from our um, conversations with our participants in growth through our online courses and elsewhere, that people are really interested in growing these, but not very confident about how well they work and if they work for them. So we set up an experiment to test this out. So we tested polycultures and monocultures growing together. And we can take a look now at the first slide, which shows our map of experimenters. So people from all around the world were joining in with this experiment, um, although focused in uh, Europe. And we grew together uh, climbing beans, spinach and radish, each uh, separately as a monoculture and then combined together in a polyculture. And the next slide we'll see, you'll see results from these experiments. So if you were following in our latest online course from Data to Action, you will see something similar. These are now updated with results from data submitted until December. And we thankfully see a very similar pattern to what we saw in our online course. So the graph on the left there is showing you that polycultures tended on the whole to be significantly more productive than monocultures. And this analysis is um, paired for participants. So it's taking into account what happens uh, in an individual site or with individual practice. The graph there on the right shows that actually a large bulk of this um, difference in polycultures is coming from the beans and radish, which tended to be more successful in polycultures, whereas spinach significant, not, not significantly, but slightly less. Um, the next graph is um, part of a sequence of an animation, and this is showing yields in August um, for the polycultures and monocultures, and we've just separated out the UK there. Um, what this sequence would show us is that as we as we go through from planting in May through to the latest harvest in November, we see um, pr productivity down in the south of Europe, so around Spain, Portugal, um, increasing earlier in the growing season. And then it's in the far north of these maps later in the growing season. So if people still harvesting there in October and November, perhaps because we've had an unusual year uh, with different seasons. Um, but that's where coming together to share our data can help us to get these really good deep insights. And we're, we will be further analysing this data and sharing results coming up in, in blogs and other media that we communicate with. 
And in those also, we're going to be, as Victoria said, we've been reviewing different regenerative practices to look at what's the current evidence for these and how can we work together to improve this. Um, you can find that in our free app, which is on iOS and um, Android. And if we take a look at the next slide, you get a little screenshot there of what it looks like. So there's different ways um, to improve your soils and also ecosystems. So you can get some really good practical, well-researched advice for those. Um, we also have in that app the ability to see our planting and harvesting dates. You can see what can I plant in my location right now. Now, that's based on the best available information that we've collated from many different sources. However, we do know there are errors and gaps in this, and this is where you can help us. So if you're using the app and you find that, you know, actually, I can't really plant that now, or hey, there's a whole bunch of things missing that I could be planting in my area now. You can help us improve this data for everybody by letting us know. You can do this if you're on Facebook. We have a Facebook group called um, My Shared Planting Calendars and uh, or sorry share my planting calendars um, you can find that in facebook if you're not on facebook you can email susan directly on calendar at roeobservatory.org to let her know what the differences you've seen what crops you're planting where you are when you've planted them when you expect to harvest them so we look forward to hearing from you on that and again helping us to coordinate our data by working together so i'm going to pass back over to mal now Okay, thanks Naomi. That's that's really interesting. So I'm going to now go to the first of our two questions, um, asking to Victoria. Um, so many grow participants, whether they're experienced growers or new to growing, are interested in improving their soil. What's the first step you would recommend to somebody who wants to learn more about their soil's health? Okay, thanks Mel. So um, the thing to remember is that all soils are different. And so what you need to do to improve your soil might depend on what type of soil you have, what your climate's like, and of course, what you're growing. So a good place to start is with our uh, Grow Online courses, which give you um, practical um, activities to find out what type of soil you have, what its texture is, and your growing environment. And once um, you know more about that, you could interact with some of our other learners and find out about what um, techniques can be used to improve your soil. Uh, back to Mel. Thanks, Victoria. Um, I'm going to now um, pose a couple of questions that I think have come in for Pavlos. Um, we've got a question here about the um, data artwork that was launched today by the Code of Soil. Um, there's a, somebody, an audience member, asking, is it free to download? So that's our first question, Pavlos. Yes, sure. This is absolutely free by visiting the By the Code of Soil uh, um, area in uh, the GROW website and uh, it is going to be available as soon as 1,000 uh, users download this app in their desktop or um, desktop computers. And, and I've got another question for you, Pavlos, here. Um, the question is, how can people taking part in this webinar, so the people, our audience now, here today, live, who might be celebrating World Soil Day in their local allotments or their school food garden, how can they be part of a more global World Soil Day conversation? So that's Pavlos as well. The World Soil Day has a main hashtag, hashtag stop soil pollution. By using that on Twitter or other social media, you can connect with the conversation happening globally. But then we are also using the Grow Soil Health hashtag if you want to track the discussion that is taking place uh, through the grow handle as well as our grow places and of course if you would like to ask questions for this webinar you can use um, the link on the YouTube channel you are watching right now but also if you are following on Twitter use hashtag grow webinar that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Pavlos. So I think now um, we're going to go over to Alice and she's going to tell us about other regenerative practices you can use to improve your soil health. So um, over to Alice.
Hi, so recently I have been gathering information on swale and contour methods for the regenerative practices literature review for the Grow Observatory. Today I'm going to discuss these methods and why they are so important, especially in a growing climate, um, changing climate. So surface runoff is the flow of excess water that happens above ground after heavy rainfall or a storm. It happens when rain arrives more quickly than the soil can absorb it. It is most erosive on hill slopes where gravity causes this runoff to move down slope, taking topsoil with it. The slopes don't have to be steep for this to be a problem. Soil erosion is one of the main causes of soil degradation and it's often exacerbated by our agricultural and growing practices. However, physical factors such as climate, topography and soil characteristics also have a significant impact on soil vulnerability. Soils feed us and with a growing worldwide population, we need to not only look after and maintain them, but also regenerate them. So a multitude of sources, including the FAO, state that in the future, we are to expect greater weather extremes, which will likely increase the vulnerability of our soils. Farms are expanding in a response to a growing global population, and as a result, farmers are moving more and more to these vulnerable hill slopes to grow their crops. So contour methods work with the land's natural topography to lessen runoff and therefore erosion as well. And they can even store precipitation. All of the methods I'm about to speak about use the contours in our landscape, which are lines of equal height above sea level. So the first method I'm going to discuss is swales. Swales are long, shallow, completely level trenches that follow the contours in our landscape. The soil that's removed when creating the trench is piled on the downhill side to make a berm. The theory is that heavy rain will collect in the swale and then slowly spread and infiltrate the soil rather than running down the hill. So in a dry climate, they can be extra useful as the water is harvested underground to provide your plants with water through dry periods. In this slide, the swales have been filled with a permeable mulch. Unfortunately, swales are Unfortunately, swales are often ineffective against large storms where high flow velocities can overtop the berm. They are also impractical in areas that are very flat, steep or poorly drained. Contour plowing or contour farming is the practice of plowing and or planting across a slope following the contour lines. This creates spaces in between the plants where water can collect, reducing runoff and erosion and promoting infiltration. So these methods are used in larger scale agriculture, but what can you do on your own plot? First, identify where on your plot water is wasted and where it doesn't drain well, i.e. where it runs downhill. Then create your water retention feature just upslope from this. Swales can be beautiful as well as practical. To create one in your garden, you need to dig a, dig a shallow trench along your plot's contour. The soil from the trench is mounted on the downhill side to form a burn. Um, you can fill your swales with anything permeable. In this image, the swale is filled with rocks. If your slope is very steep, swales may be a bad idea as digging can actually destabilize the soil on the steeper slopes. If you do have a steeper slope, rather than creating a swale, you could try creating small berms out of rocks and stones. These will be functional, stopping and slowing runoff and erosion, and also quite aesthetic. Another option is raised beds. You can create raised beds in areas with poor drainage, and they will promote infiltration, store water, and prevent runoff. They can also be really easy to make. So, 
write down the link in this next image to see how Kathy uses old beer bottles to create raised beds on her badly drained plot. And remember, simply planting across a slope following the natural contour lines rather than going up and down the hill can reduce erosion and runoff too. And just a quick note that when constructing anything, ensure you reduce compaction as much as possible as compaction in your soil will, inf will reduce infiltration ability of your soil. So next we have Pavlos talking about the changing climate mission. Thanks, Alice. Really interesting indeed. And uh, a lot of the farmers that are following some of those techniques have been championing our changing climate mission in our grow places. A grow place is a specific priority area, a geographic priority area, where uh, we are planning to install uh, hundreds of soil moisture sensors, which we are delivering for free to our communities. Um, we want to create this grid of soil measurements in situ in order to ground truth uh, the satellite data that is being provided by the Sentinel-1 satellite system. So, so far we have been very effectively generating and nourishing communities in nine grow places in nine European countries. We have grow places in Greece, in Austria, in Portugal, in Spain, in Hungary, in Luxembourg, in Netherlands, in Scotland and in Ireland. As you can see, we have covered the geographic diversity uh, of uh, Europe from north to south and from east to west. And also, uh, some of those grow places are capturing some of the soil diversity in Europe as well. We are delivering the change in climate mission uh, with the help of a group of highly motivated community champions. And here you can see a photo of Oh, I think we just lost Pavlos. Um, but hey, here's a really nice photograph of our community champions at a recent event in Grow Place Austria, as you can see. Um, I'm going to pass back to you now, Mel. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much. I think um, Pavlos will be starting to, to rejoin us. Um, but of course, um, the Grow Places that we've got um, working with us in the community champions will be continuing their work into, into next year, well, but where they're, they're looking at um, maintaining, um, gathering data, um, learning about the soil, and placing sensors. So I think we've got a slide coming up that shows um, some of the sensors that are being placed out there in the soil. You can see um, from this um, image here that we have um, a sensor um, that's gathering um, data on temperature, um, it's gathering data on, on sunlight, gathering data on conductivity, which relates to um, um, fertility, a supposed fertility of soil. Um, but most important, most important um, data streams for us is the one of soil moisture. Um, and this is what our, our, um, our individual um, grow sensor looks like. Um, our aim is in each of our grow places to be situating uh, around about 12, um, in, in total 12,000 sensors, so that's just over 1,000 um, grow um, sensors um, in the gridded format for each place, so that's quite a lot. As you can imagine, some of the uh, stories that are coming out of our grow places are varied. Um, I think Pavlos has just come back to us now, um, and so we're going to go back to Pavlos to hear some of the stories that are coming out of the grow places um, from across uh, um, Scotland down to the Mediterranean um, and west and east of there as well. Um, over to you, Pavlos. Yes, I apologize for that. My connection somehow dropped and I apologize for any frustrations which might have caused. So I was saying that we are delivering the change in climate mission uh, with a network of highly motivated community champions who are working with us uh, to recruit participants, to deliver sensors and provide useful insights and feedback as we are unfolding the mission. So far we have more than 2,000 sensors effectively returning data to grow and uh, uh, it is very easy for users to go out in their growing spaces, install a sensor. You can see on the slide how this uh, soil moisture sensor look, looks like. Um, this is the best 
uh, low-cost sensors that exist, and Grow has the entire global stock of it. It's the flower power sensor by Parrot. And it, every 15 minutes, it measures soil moisture, temperature, sunlight, and electrical conductivity. All those measurements together are establishing a soil moisture regime, which is very important to understand what are the needs of our crops, or, but also, in another level, it's contributing very important data to validate the satellites. And this is what this Changing Climate mission is all about. We have had some very interesting observations coming from our users in the various grow places. For example, I can share with you the story of a winemaker in northeastern Greece, um, a grower who has been uh, growing organic vines since a number of years. And because of the contour on her land, she was astonished to see that the soil moisture levels in different plots of her vineyard are different than expected. Or another grower who is uh, growing vegetables in a garden, um, he was able to uh, decrease the use of water used for irrigation during the dry summer months in Greece by 40%. And by the same time, he also observed that the cheese tomatoes were tasting better. But also, we have an amazing and very inspiring regenerative project of 44 hectares in southern Portugal. It is a big ecosystem regeneration farm where uh, our uh, user there has been following some of the techniques explained by Alice earlier on. And now by using the soil moisture sensors, he has a way to quantify his observations and also to draw very interesting insights on how to conserve waters. And as you know, Portugal is also a dryland region. They face similar challenges as we do here in Greece. And then a little bit north up in Portugal, uh, the University of Lisbon, our community champions in Portugal, are installing about 500 sensors in a large-scale ecosystem restoration research project on the traditional cork oak forests. So these are some tangible examples on how uh, the grow data, the soil moisture data, is also fed back to the users and the communities of practice, practice themselves. It's quite interesting as we are entering, uh, we have another year ahead of us, and how other audiences like uh, local tech communities or decision makers are starting supporting the mission at the local level. Uh, if you have any questions about the sensors, I'm happy to answer them later on on that webinar. Okay, I think it's over to me now. So thanks uh, for that, Pavlos. Before we move to the start of our questions, I'll just remind everybody, we're inviting questions from course learners. We're inviting questions from the audience here today on the, on the webinar. Um, and we're reminding you to still send your questions um, to the speakers on Twitter using the grow hashtag grow webinar. Um, if we don't get a chance to answer your question in this next um, section of the, of the um, broadcast, then please join in the forum at hub.growobservatory.org. That's hub.growobservatory.org, and we'll do our best to answer them from there. But now, okay, so we have our first questions coming in. Um, I've got one for Alice. Yeah, are you ready, Alice? Um, Alice, I'm interested in creating a swale in my garden. Well, I have a big pro problem with waterlogging. I don't quite understand what is a contour. How can I be sure to follow it? So over to you, Alice. Well, a contour is actually just a line of equal height above sea level. So as long as you stick to a similar height above sea level, when you're creating your feature, you're fine. So start from the point in which you intend to construct your swale and use a spirit level to ensure you're following the same height all the way along, which is the contour. Back to Mel. Okay, thanks, Alice, that's great. Um, okay, so I've got another question coming in here. Next to Naomi. Do I have to be in one of the grow places areas to record planting and harvesting data? So over to you, Naomi. Great. And just checking, you can all hear me. Yeah. Great. Um, I, I'm going to be really sneaky and just add a little bit to Alice's answer. So if you don't have a spirit level, um, water likes to be level. So you can use tubes of water or other things to, to work out if you've got like a level piece of string, for example. So you can mark it on 
on a piece of plastic or a tub or something clear and see through. So yeah, it's just an, another way of getting your contour lines. They don't have to be that perfect, but um, it's good. So do you have to be in great places to record planting and harvesting data? Absolutely not. Um, this it, We are focusing on Europe, it's a European funded project, and we're using specific bioclimatic regions that have been developed for Europe. Um, and we're looking at getting in each of those bioclimatic regions, we're looking at getting data from everywhere within those. So anywhere across Europe, you're very, very welcome to submit your planting and harvesting dates um, of any and all crops that you're interested in growing. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi. Um, I'm just going to go to a really nice, a quick comment from Michael Kelly, who's taking part in the webinar. Um, Michael says, could you please give a shout out to our second year soil science class in IT Carlo Wexford campus? Really interesting stuff. Hey, Michael. <laughs> Thanks for uh, sending that. Um, I'm going to go back again now to Alice before going to Pavlos. The questions are coming in thick and fast now. Um, so from, for Alice from, from Tarak Tobin, I hope I've said your name correctly, um, who's watching on the webinar, why does topography have such an impact on soil? Awesome, thank you. That's a really interesting question. So topography actually has a really strong um, influence on soil development. They, on hill slopes, soils tend to be shallower due to erosional losses, which happen due to rainfall tending to run downhill rather than infiltrate the soil like on flatter ground, picking up the topsoil with it. And if soils are high, there is very different vegetation and less deposition of material uh, of organic materials due to the harsher climates, meaning that soil accumulation is less. On the other hand, soils on lower flat ground tend to be deeper and darker and contain more organic matter due to more accumulation, less erosion and generally less harsh climates. They also tend to be wetter because water collects in flat areas. Um, I hope that answers your question. Back to Mel. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, um, uh, Alice. Um, I think we've got um, a question here from Einut Barbil to Pavlos. Um, so Einut has uh, taken part in the MOOCs and the experiment and is also taking part in the webinar right now. So hello to you. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly as well. Um, he wanted to ask Pavlos about swales. Um, I suppose in, in Greece, given the uh, Mediterranean climate, um, I'm not saying he's assuming you've got, you need extra water in summer. Thank you. So, Pavlos, in case um, you need to... I'm not sure I, I, I got the question <laughs> exactly. Yeah, okay, so <clears throat> the question was, I wanted to ask Pavlos about swales. I assume he needs extra water in summer. So I'm, I'm assuming the, the question is, do you contour or do you use swales yourself in your growing pavlots? Well, in, my, uh, in our region, we don't have so steep slopes, so these are not necessary and would not work. However, in a lot of the Greek islands, uh, the traditional landscape are those terraces and swales, uh, where traditionally they have been used for effectively keeping the soil intact so growing can take place. Um, to tell you the truth, as a mainstream in Greece, uh, water conservation techniques in farming are not very mainstream and this is the big struggle of uh, communities working on agroecology and regenerative agriculture. And uh, we have been uh, documenting some of those stories and how they use particular plants in order to keep uh, the soil from um, falling apart, but also how to conserve uh, water. Uh, one thing is to be able to harvest more water during the dry summer plants, but another beautiful thing about the Mediterranean agriculture is that we have a lot of dryland crops that can grow with uh, low amounts of water, a lot of uh, uh, nut trees and fig trees and olive trees can really do well with not so uh, big amounts of uh, water. However, also those traditional crops are now being 
very heavily challenged by climate change as the temperature fluctuates. Uh, and uh, talking about temperature and drought or moisture is not only a matter of bioavailability of water to the plants, it's also a matter of what type of pests and other flora grows uh, around those plants. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Pavlos. Um, I have got a question for Naomi. Naomi, um, you may want to um, pass this over, but I'm, I'm going to give it to you. And if you want to pass it to somebody else, please do. Um, this is a question from uh, Michael, um, who's taking part in the webinar. Will putting the soil sensors under electric fences affect them? Oh, hi, Michael. That's a really interesting question, to which I quite honestly don't know the answer. I can say two things about that. Um, firstly, the, um, the soil moisture measure is actually a measure of electrical conductivity in the soil. So if you do have them too close to an electric fence with, but they wouldn't, not, the electric fences wouldn't normally have um, electricity running into the soil. Um, so that might be a consideration. I would say the biggest danger would be to yourself or whoever's retrieving the data from the sensor um, that you might want to not get too close to the fence. So my advice would be not to put them too close to the electrical fences. Um, but I would think that since um, you, you saw those two, two prongs of the sensor on the, on the um, perhaps on, on the thing that we've seen before, um, it just measures electrical conductivity across that, that gap. So it's only a, a few centimetres within the soil around it that's measuring it across. So therefore, I wouldn't think the electric fence line, which would presumably be burning um, several centimetres above the soil, should have an impact, but um, I wouldn't like to guarantee it. Uh, I don't know, Pavlos, if you've got any thoughts on that, if you've more experience with the sensors. Yes, maybe. Well, um, one of the key advices we give for the change in climate mission is soil representativity. So we want the users to look, to place the sensors uh, in, a, in a location where there is 30 meters homogeneous land use. That means that it is highly unlikely that uh, we ask the users to place the sensor close to the border lines of their land where the fences are located. So, of course, health and safety is the major consideration, but uh, this is a very interesting question, in fact, that I would ask our technicians here at GROW. We never came across this uh, question, and uh, GROW being a, a project that learns, this is a very interesting question to, to get an answer to, and thank you very much. Okay, we've, we've got another one. Well, I mean, maybe, Pavlos, um, you might want to say a little bit about the testing that has and testing and validation that has been done on the sensors. Um, with winter coming up um, just now, um, um, our audience might be interested to know the results of the last winter's validation. Yeah, so, of course, GROW and the Changing Climate Mission in particular uh, combines different, um, different disciplines, different bits of science from Internet of Things to sensor technology to satellite science all the way to social sciences and how we engage uh, citizens. So uh, before we launch the mission, Europe-wide, we have tested the technology itself. We have tested that the sensors can withstand cold and weather, um, weather conditions. Uh, I think that uh, we have safely established that up to minus 20 degrees, the sensors are doing fine, they're waterproof. Of course, if we just dip them in the water, well, they might struggle. We also tested that the data is uh, effectively harvested by the Flower Power app and that the data is uh, returning to grow in a signed way. But also before launching the Changing Climate mission, we have also uh, launched a mini mission in three pilot uh, places in Greece, Ireland and Hungary. So we pretty much spent one year of testing all the protocols and the technology itself. So now we are quite confident that um, uh, the sensors are working fine, they're accurate, the data they collect is accurate, and this is also validated against professional measurements and experiments by our science team. Um, so yeah, I hope I'm answering your question. I'm just gonna pass um, straight over to uh, Victoria, Victoria, I hope this isn't a surprise because I know you've written a blog recently 
um, that touches on some of these subjects. So maybe you want to expand a little. Yes, yeah, so there'll be a blog po uh, published hopefully uh, before the end of the year, uh, which talks a little bit about some of the testing we've done on the soil sensors, including um, what temperatures uh, we've had them out in the field at that they've managed to survive and the comparisons we've done with professional sensors and how uh, they compare to those and also how different sensors compare with each other and with different soil types so look out for that and of course it's an ongoing project so uh, as we return to winter we've had some ex um, of our sensor users saying they experience even colder temperatures than we did during the testing period so um, it'll be interesting to see um, how low the sensors can go okay thanks very much Victoria um, we've got another question coming in from one of the participants on our last online course I'm going to ask either Naomi or Victoria if you want to answer this one um, the question is um, on the last online course from data to action what's the difference between using the grow website and using the grow observatory app um, would either of you want to so uh, Naomi over to you yeah, I'll take that one. They're, they're actually quite different um, beasts. The, the website has got information about the project, so more general information, but also in the latest tab, it's got some really nice links through to these blogs that are coming up and things that have already been written, and they're all hosted on our Medium site, but linked to from there. You can also join our online discussion forum, so if you're asking questions or thinking of questions but not quite ready to ask them yet, you can ask us on those forums on the website as well. Um, behind the behind the website, there's also links to all of our um, resources and information for people participating in the changing climate mission with those sensors in those great places and in the living soils mission. So the things we've been doing with the experiment over the last year. The Grow app, on the other hand, is um, a really nice, uh, just recently released uh, application for iOS and Android, so it works on devices. And in the iOS, uh, sorry, in the app, you can find the information that we've already talked about on um, specific regenerative practices. You can find that information on what can you grow in your area generally, as well as what can I grow, what can I plant right now, if you're really keen to get going. Um, and then there's also for people participating in Grow Places, there's also um, some extra functionality in the app to help them describe where they've placed the sensor and to, to do some of those surveys for the land and soil in it as well. So I hope that helps. Um, please, please do let us know if you've got any more questions about these things. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Naomi. Um, Pavlos, I've got a question or a, a sort of two-part question here for you that, that builds on what you've said already and, and maybe Victoria might want to come in if you want to want to also contribute. There's a question uh, from Peter B, who's taken part in our online courses. Um, he would like to know more about the accuracy of the soil moisture measurements, that's one thing. And the second part of that question is the extent to which the readings vary according to soil type. So the first one was the accuracy of soil moisture measurements. Can we expand on that a little? Um, when will we be publishing some of that data maybe? Um, over to you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks Peter. Um, as said, as said, as said, excuse me, excuse me, I'm just to the count right now. Um, as said before, the sensors have been tested against professional scientific equipment, so we are confident that the measurements that we are receiving are accurate. And this is also that uh, uh, our users can also uh, confirm, myself included, I have, uh, I have placed about 50 soil moisture sensors in my olives. Some of them are located quite close to each other, and um, uh, we can safely say that the, uh, the readings are similar meaning that uh, the, the, the equipment is uh, taking the measurements in a, in, a, in a standard way. And then to the other part of the question, the extent to which readings vary according to soil type. Um, 
this is the logic that uh, different soils will have different uh, soil measure soil moisture retention capacities this is a combination of different um, chemical and biological aspects of the soil that have a role for example sandy soils will the water will percolate easier uh, so and precipitate easier so we expect to have um, lower soil moisture in areas in soils that are higher in sand for example to do so we are asking the our users to do a land survey which describes the characteristics of the land around the sensor location and all this data is coming together with the soil moisture data in order to establish that um, you know how different land use types and land landscapes and land features are affecting soil moisture that's great. Thank you very much, Pavlos. I think we've got time for one more question um, before we start to um, wrap this afternoon. Um, I've got one to Alice. Naomi, you would probably be able to answer or, or build on what Alice says. Um, there's a question about what, what we can do to improve soil over the winter months. So over to you, Alice, if that's okay. Hi, yeah, that's fine. Um, I'll start off and then pass to Naomi if she has anything to add. So the winter is actually a great time to remove all your weeds from the summer. And you could also add compost or an organic mulch so that it can slowly break down over the winter and into the spring. Naomi, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, thanks. And thanks for a really great question. It's a really nice one to finish on and um, perfect mm -hmm. time of year we're in. Um, I think over winter soil is absolutely critical time for soils. And there's a tendency to see, especially around here on lots of allotment plots, um, people wanting to, to leave their soil bare. There are a few advantages to that. So frost damage in uh, northerly climates can help break up the soil and improve the structure if you've got big lumpy soils. But on the whole, um, what that bare soil means is that it's much more prone to erosion. So from, from water erosion, um, so water flooding through, but also from freeze thaw action um, and um, wind damage and other sources of erosion as well. So I'd say it's much better practice to keep your soil covered up where that's practical. And that can be with mulching, as Alice has said, so things like cardboard or compost or manure that could be overtopped um, on the soil. But also with living um, mulches, so things like um, Victoria showed earlier, pictures of some phacelia in it, or other kinds of green manures that you can use. And those, those will um, both form the job with the plant roots of holding that soil structure over the winter, as well as giving you some uh, organic matter to dig in in the early spring to get your soils ready um, and active and, and feed all those lovely living things in your soils to get them ready for growing again in the new season. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Naomi. Um, it's great to finish off on, on tips about overwinter and preparing ourselves for the spring. I'm sure that approaching the shortest um, day in the year, we're very, very um, um, much looking forward to those days getting a bit longer and getting out into the garden and onto the land uh, more regularly. So, um, uh, so I think uh, we have a number of questions that we've not answered. There's questions around um, the sensors and wind farms and, and some others, keep those questions coming in to us. We will um, look at answering those on the on the forum and on our Twitter stream back out to back out to you. So if you've not had the chance to answer a question in this time, we'll do our best to get those answers out to you. Um, but for now, um, I'd like to wrap up for this afternoon um, to say thank you um to all of our participants our audiences here today it's been absolutely fantastic um, to hear from you all um, and of course to our speakers to alice um to naomi um to pavlos and to Vic victoria very much so thank you for um your great uh, ad libbing on the questions that were coming in live from our participants um, so what's happening next? Um, we would say enjoy the rest of the World Soul Day celebrations. Um, we've got some information um, on the knowledge hub of the Grow Observatory. If you search for Grow Observatory on World Soul Day, you'll find us and you'll see what the remaining program is for us. Um, other things that are happening in the spring, 
we're going to be running a revised um, version of our Citizen Science Soul to Sky course, which starts on the Future Learn platform on the 11th of February. So do join us for that. Um, you can also join the Grow community through Facebook um, or Twitter uh, or Medium by searching Grow Observatory. And I think on the screen there, you can see all of those links. So please do join us on those um, channels. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you there. Um, and finally, um, I'd just like to say on behalf of, of, of us all, um, thanks to all of the GROW partners, um, which make this fantastic project worthwhile. I think we've got a slide which show all of them there. So you can see how many of us are, be, are behind the project. And, and I think at any one time, there's sometimes up to 80 people working away in the background. Um, so a big thank you to those. And of course, the European Commission who provided the funding for us um, for this project. So um, without further ado, we'll say goodbye for now. Um, we'll see you in the spring live for another webinar. Um, have a fantastic um, um, festive celebration coming up. Um, and we look forward to interacting with you um, through our social media channels on the Grow Forum, in our webinars, um, and the remaining World Soul Day celebrations. So happy World Soul Day. Goodbye, everyone.